Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Rumi Forum and to a talk that uh, I'm excited about. Uh, I'm Peter Kovac. Uh, I run a interagency office at the Department of State that does what we call strategic communication. Uh, I'll say no more about that. You can ask me what that means afterwards. Uh, I RSVP'd yes for this talk because I think that the general area of expertise that Dr. Alvarez brings to the table is a very, very important part of what the President uh, meant when he said that we will deal with, with the Muslim world from a platform of respect. Uh, I think that the, this, in a way, is a, a talk, as I understand it, on the falling away from some of the ideals of the Golden Age, but also some of the cultural and civilizational legacies. Similarly, uh, I think that in the past, uh, in the past seven years or so, we've couched too much of the dialogue uh, in terms of the religion. And uh, a lot of the problems in this world are not about religion, and religion, in fact, uh, can be a bridge and a solution. Uh, and I like to hear and learn more about this period because I think it's about the civilization, and the civilization uh, is, in a way, uh, a shining city on the hill uh, for all of us. For, for Muslim friends, it was the golden age of, of uh, philosophy a great epoch, uh, but for us Westerners, us European Westerners in particular, we would not have our classical civilization if it weren't for the Arab uh, Islamic scholarship uh, in Andalusia, uh, in Damascus, uh, in Baghdad, uh, because in fact uh, it was our dark ages and uh, without that transmission, without the original thinking and interpretation that went on in, in the uh, Muslim uh, courts and, and scholarly circles, we wouldn't have many of our classics that uh, some of us uh, didn't enjoy studying that much, but we certainly <laughs> have to acknowledge uh, <laughs> the legacy of, of Plato and Aristotle and, and the great Greeks and Roman thinkers uh, that were transmitted. So that's, uh, I think, uh, a very important part of the respect. The, the other thing I would say, uh, looking at uh, Dr. Alvarez's uh, biography, is that one of the things I admire about uh, the Islamic civilization, and I should say civilizations, is the fact that I don't think there's another tradition, certainly in the West, that has more of a popular culture of mysticism, uh, of, of beginning uh, with the premise that, that God is within and, and that life's task is to peel away the layers and, and purify and, and realize that. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's, that's such a potential bridge-building message. So, and I know it's one that, that is close to the Rumi Forum. Uh, so without any further ado, I will uh, hand the floor to uh, Dr. Alvarez, who, by the way, in Morocco, is called Dr. Alvarez, as in <laughs> Alfaris. Uh, so it, it shows, I asked her what got her interested in this field, and she said, well, it's, it's kind of the, the uh, Hispanic legacy and, and the proximity that, in, in a way, and certainly in the period that she has studied so deeply, uh, the lines were rather blurred. Uh, it was just a little straight uh, separating uh, Morocco from Spain. Um, she is uh, the acting director of the Medieval and Byzantine Studies Center at the Catholic University of America, and she's an associate professor, tenured, at the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. And that tenure is such a great thing because <laughs> it, it's the great liberation. Now we're going to really see some great scholarship. Uh, she's a graduate of Yale University, has published on Islamic mysticism, intellectual history, and literature in medieval Spain. Uh, her latest book, Abu al Hassan al Shushari, Songs of Love and Devotion, uh, will be published by the Paulist, Paulist Press later this year. And uh, I, I'll give you the floor. Dr. Uh, Alvarez has indicated to me that she wouldn't mind being interrupted uh, with questions. If that does, does that upset the apple cart too much in terms of the production? Actually, you prefer uh, first okay. to talk and then the Q&A session. Okay. All right. But you can okay. interrupt with questions. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm yeah. going to be a polite <laughs> listener. <laughs> Well, thank you. We're all ears. All right. Well, thank you so thank you so much for that really wonderful and very apropos um, introduction. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to have been invited to speak before uh, the members of the Rumi Forum, um, and I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions and the discussion that um, that ensues after my talk. Um, I just wanted to add the caveat.
caveat that I've prepared this talk very much for a general audience. So I certainly hope that I'm not um, insulting any specialists mm -hmm. by glossing over all the fun and um, fascinating details that uh, of necessity have to get left out of a, a short talk like this. Um, in the last 20 years or so, the topic of medieval Spain has come into fashion. Books like Maria Rosa Menocal's Ornament of the World, How Muslims, Christians, and Jews Created a Culture of Tolerance, or Chris Loney's A Vanished World, Medieval Spain's Golden Age of Enlightenment, have garnered widespread attention and substantial sales. Documentaries like Cities of Light and countless music CDs with titles like Iberian Garden and um, the Splendor of Al-Andalus celebrate the rich culture that flourished around, among Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Spain during the Middle Ages. In the Arab world, feature films like Yusuf Shaheen's Celebrated Destiny, Nasser Khamir's uh, The Lost Neck Ring of the Dove, and even Amr Diab's music video Nur al-Ain look longingly to an Al-Andalus symbolizing refinement and tolerance. These are all aimed, these, all these works are aimed at general audiences, not specialists, and by necessity they present a long and complex history in a somewhat schematic form. Despite much oversimplification, these works have served a vital service in countering or beginning to counter the view, still widely held by so many in the West, and a view that I think all of us here uh, would uh, soundly reject, that Islam is by its very nature incapable of peacefully coexisting with other religions. Scholars, myself included, can point to some of the remarkable achievements of Islamic Spain. The creation of vital cities like Toledo, Cordoba, Sevilla, and Granada, which served as hubs of learning and drew scholars of all faiths from both the Islamic world and Christian Europe. Advances in science, medicine, astronomy, and irrigation technology and you know, I'll stop for a moment just to talk about just the subject of irrigation technology. Thomas Glick, in some very interesting studies, has looked at how some of the advances in irrigation that were pioneered uh, under Muslim rule very quickly, much earlier than anyone had thought, crossed over that what, what had previously been thought of as a kind of impenetrable, hostile boundary to uh, areas run by the Christians. This is, this is just one of mounting evidence that, you know, it, it, we're not talking about a civilization with, you know, very hard bo borders, but rather that culture and knowledge and technology w moved over across that border, which was much more porous than we had uh, thought before. Um, we, we have also the spectacular architecture, like the Great Mosque of Cordoba or Medina Tazahra. Uh, and here I might point to the work of Geraldine Dodds, uh, who, uh, a wonderful art historian, uh, who shows how the architects of these buildings echoed local pre-existing architectural motifs. That is, they drew on architectural motifs that were um, the, the patrimony, if you will, of these um, uh, 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 Christians uh, living in, in the Iberian Peninsula, um, and then and made their own buildings a sort of cross-cultural dialogue in stone, if you will. We marvel at Cordoba, which in the 10th century had street lights, running water, and a magnificent library of volumes collected from near and far. We remember the writings of philosophers like Averroes, whose great commentaries on Aristotle would pay, play a crucial role uh, in transmitting Greek philosophy to Christian Europe. We also hail the great Jewish scholar, medical doctor, and philosopher Maimonides. The philosopher and mystic Ibn Tufayl, whose remarkable philosophical novel, Hai Ibn Yaksan, is said to be the inspiration for Robinson Crusoe. And if you haven't read it, that, that is, uh, the Hai Ibn Yaksan is a marvelous uh, uh, work. Sufi thinkers uh, like Ibn al-Arabi, whose famous verses may be quite familiar to many of you. My heart can take on any form for gazelles, a meadow, a cloister for monks. For the idol, sacred ground, Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, the tables of the Torah, the scrolls of the Quran. I profess the religion of love, wherever its caravan turns, along the way, that is the belief, the faith I keep. Or Abul Hasan al-Shushtari, another Sufi mystic born a couple of generations later, uh, my beloved encompasses all existence. 
He is visible in white and black and in Christian and Jew and in the letters and their points. Just understand me, just understand me. In the plants and in the minerals, in black and in white, in the pen and the ink, in this there is no mistake. Just understand me, just understand me. I could give many more examples of scholars, thinkers, and mystics whose work embodies a commitment to deep values, who ask people to turn away from pettiness and superficial differences of sects and creeds, to extend and deepen human knowledge, to alleviate the suffering of the sick and the poor, and to better appreciate the wonder and majesty of creation. I think it is very important for us, especially in the West, to know about these towering achievements, these remarkable intellectuals, for many reasons, not least because it serves as an antidote to a kind of arrogance about Western cultural superiority. Still, I fear that in sim oversimplifying the picture we have of this long and complex period, in discounting local conditions and specificities, we risk, most importantly, polarizing our conversations because not everyone ag agrees with, uh, with this view, nor could, can everyone agree with this view because there's, men there's much evidence um, that uh, goes against an overly rosy picture. Um, and and my, my greatest fear with some, with some of these works is that they open themselves up to critique and by not presenting a fully fleshed out enough picture, they, they actually undermine and undercut their message. So I, so I want to highlight that as, as one, of, one of the reasons why I think it's very important for us to not only look at the the periods of time in this history, which which all of us I think can admire, uh, and and I teach with great with great uh, pride and 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 delight to my undergraduate students, uh, but also um, some of the moments uh, that are hard and harsh, uh, and um, and which I think hold important lessons for us. Um, Many of these popular admiring uh, accounts of Islamic Spain prefer not to go into great depth on the period uh, that most concerns me here. That is, the time of the two Berber dynasties that ruled Spain from 1089 to early in the 13th century, the Almoravids and the Almohads. The narratives tend to establish a rather stark contrast between these two religiously motivated regimes and earlier governments uh, painted not only as more secular, if you will, but, but almost libertine. Um, the biggest problem with this is that, it, first of all, it glosses over earlier episodes, which are also marked by intolerance. It sets up this kind of radical black and white um, mm -hmm. uh, situation, which is, is not helpful in our, in our understanding of the period. Um, there is no doubt that during these two centuries, or roughly two centuries, of the Berber rule in um, Islamic Spain, uh, that religious minorities suffered violence, first forced conversions, and involuntary relocations. Suddenly, we see Sufi leaders persecuted, jailed, or murdered by the state. Averroes' books are burned, wine merchants put out of business, vineyards destroyed, sellers of musical instruments attacked, and so forth. Uh, these Moroccan rulers are routinely dismissed as uncouth fanatics who, would, who could not comprehend Al-Andalus' sophistication and who violently opposed the lax practice of Islam. Because both movements were Moroccan Berber and fueled by heightened religious sensibility, generally little effort is made in these popular accounts to make dis to distinguish between the two groups. So it's just you know one is one group is more fanatic than the next is a ve very very common kind of refrain that we get in these um, accounts. Um, in my brief remarks today, I can't go into great detail, but I want to lay out some idea of the forces at play as Islamic Spain goes into decline. Um, now, I'd like to make clear that the title of my talk does not mean to imply that I accept that manichaeistic view of tolerance and then tolerance ended. Um, I, I want to qu question that while at the same time uh, acknowledging the fact that, that truly um, the, the, the political decline, the civilizational decline, leads to a kind of spiral. Um, and that spiral just intensifies, and it had a very, a very unfortunate outcome for everybody. 
Um, the aim of any study called the end of tolerance is getting closer to understanding what factors, policies, beliefs, or ideologies uh, um, promoted peaceful coexistence. What factors, policies, and beliefs undermined it. But always we're speaking in relative terms. Let's begin with the arrival of the Almoravids to Spain. We're talking the 11th century. The Umayyad Caliphate, the caliphate that had been that so that so very much um, celebrated in all of these accounts, uh, had crumbled earlier in the century, undermined by succession struggles, over reliance on mercenaries, and a resurgence of uh, ethnic and regional divisions. It splintered. It splintered into what are commonly called the Taifa kingdoms or the party states, which were subject to local leaders or they're sometimes even called warlords, uh, who engaged in constant competition and um, battles with each other. Ironically, this period is seen as something of a golden age in the arts. Why? I mean, it's it's very curious that this period of uh, of of internecine struggle would, would be that. But it's because these every one of these petty kingdoms, and there are quite a, a few of them, uh, w w vied in the patronage of the arts. And, and if we recall that the poet uh, is the, the kind of public relations uh, uh, vehicle for for these um, uh, monarchs. Um, each one vied in hiring poets, and when the poet when the conditions weren't right, the poet could go off uh, to another area. So too with the creation of monuments. Uh, so they are they're all vying and competing for the top talent in the cr in uh, architecture, in um, in poetry, uh, and and so on. Um, Many of these um, rulers uh, saw no problem in establishing alliances with Christian leaders to the north against their neighbors. The Christian kingdoms welcomed the revenue that this generated uh, and were able to take advantage as these states weakened each other, facilitating the task of reconquest. Basically, Muslims were paying Christians to invade lands held by other Muslims. Not a few could see that this would end badly. By 1085, when Toledo fell to the Christians, the Taifas appealed to the Moroccan Almoravids for support. It was an uneasy alliance. The Taifa rulers looked down upon the desert warriors and, um, <clears throat> and the Berbers were weary of being drawn into a, um, a difficult uh, military situation whose risks outweighed its potential benefits. After repeatedly coming to their aid, the Almoravids, convinced that the immoral and self-serving Taifa warlords were incapable of working for the greater good, deposed them and claimed power over Islamic Spain, over Al-Andalus for themselves. Now, I think it's important to note that initially the Almoravids enjoyed popular support. And this is despite the fact that, that vast differences in language, which is the most obvious difference, and cultural um, uh, practices uh, separated them from the population of, um, of Islamic Spain. The, the Almoravids speak Berber, people in Spain generally speak uh, uh, Arabic. Um, the, but why, So why would they support them? The Almoravids won important military battles against the Christians, and that's probably, that's, you know, at the forefront. But also, they brought an end to the constant battles between the principalities, which were, were sapping people's uh, energy and causing constant upheaval. Um, but perhaps most importantly, they reduced taxes. They reduced the crushing, uh, the crushing un-Islamic taxes that had been levied by the Taifa leaders. So there was uh, widespread uh, happiness uh, that, that at their initial arrival. Um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of this regime uh, was that they um, relied on the local Maliki Fukaha, or the local uh, Maliki uh, legal scholars. Now, a, a couple of notes without going into depth about that. The Malikis are well known for uh, a, a kind of um, uh, literalism in their in their readings, uh, their uh, opposition to ijtihad, their opposition to um, certain philosophical strains uh, in uh, in Quranic uh, interpretation, um, and they were very focused on the idea of um, the of the law of the letter of the law that the importance of practices is the le is the letter of the law so these these are uh, scholars who have big legal books and they don't want to have a discussion about what the deeper meaning of the Quran um, 
Now, now, how did the relig how did religious mi minorities fare under the Almoravids? Um, in I think it's first it's in part important to, to point out that attacks against Jews predated the arrival of the Almoravids. So th it's not that that any of this uh, in began with them. In 1066, enraged crowds spurred by vicious anti-Jewish rhetoric killed three to four thousand Jews in Granada. Uh, Almoravid rule would also be punctuated by explosions of anti-Semitic violence. The situation of, um, of Christians or Mozarabs uh, under the Almoravids was complicated by strategic concerns. There's evidence that the Christian side sometimes claimed that the purpose of its raids was to liberate um, the uh, Christians living under Muslim rule, whether these communities wish to be liberated or not. So this increases the suspicion that these minority religious communities are like a fifth column that are not entirely loyal to their government, but working possibly in cahoots uh, with communities to the north. Um, now, so, so what does this trigger? It tri first of all, it triggers, you know, gradually communities are feeling uh, uh, unhappy with the scrutiny of their of their motives start start uh, filtering to the north, and that's a, a tendency that, that continues to increase. Um, and uh, we have. Um, uh, some uh, in some uh, conversion or forcible re relocation to areas in the south. So one of the government's responses was, okay, uh, we're going to move you away from the border where you, you, you Christians can be um, claimed to be the, the kind of pretext for these attacks um, and where you are not in a position to aid um, the, the the Christian governments in the north in their military attacks. So so that gives I mean a little bit of it. So what what what's the the, the net result is that you have diminishing di diminishing communities of uh, Christians uh, throughout uh, the the 12th century. By um, now um, uh, in southern Spain, what is now Andalusia. Uh, Sufi leaders, many inspired by the work of Al-Ghazali, were gathering large followings uh, which the government, and particularly the Maliki Fuqaha, found um, threatening. These leaders galvanized public dissatisfaction with um, living conditions, tax policy, because the Almoravids were not able to maintain their initial tax policy, uh, and you know, as they went back on their, uh, on their electoral promises, so to speak, um, uh, sentiment uh, rose against them, um, and uh, probably, um, and this is attested very much in the in the in uh, in the writings of these Sufi leaders, um, greedy and corrupt fukaha, uh, uh, legal scholars who you know live lives of luxury and with no concern for the poor, no concern for these uh, groups of people that are suffering so, and still claim to be living the truest form of Islam, and that. Uh, it enraged people. It certainly uh, gave, brought many people over to the to the Sufis. Um, now, um, uh, you can already sense what's coming. Uh, Al Ghazali's books were banned uh, and burned. Uh, in 1142, Sufi leaders Ibn Barajan, Ibn Al Arif, uh, and Abu Bakr Muhammad Al Mayurki were arrested. All three died that same year, either executed or under, under uh, suspicious circumstances. Um, two years later, the Sufi leader Ibn Qasi led a military revolt um, against the Almoravids. And while that revolt was successful only for a short amount of time and didn't, certainly we can't claim that it uh, played a, an enormous role in toppling the Almoravids, it became a kind of a focus of pressure, um, in internal pressure in the Al Almoravid area uh, in the north. So you've got military pressure from, from Christian forces that can continue having raids. You have dissent, uh, much of it kind of focalized around um, uh, Sufi ideology, which is roundly um, opposed by these um, Almoravid leaders and their Maliki um, uh, allies. Uh, and, and you have um, military pressure now coming from revolts in the south. Uh, and these revolts are led by our second Berber group, the, Almo the Almohads. Um, so, um, uh, 
if the, so if the, so so we're getting to the to the lessons um, if the Almoravids had based much of their claim to legitimacy on a scrupulous practice of Islam their failure to deliver lasting security their need to once again levy the taxes they had boasted of eliminating and the oppressive intellectual atmosphere they fostered sparked significant challenges this is the toxic mix illegitimacy if at first seen as liberators, they came to be seen as foreign occupiers without a valid claimed authority. The reliance on a local religious and juridical elite that was seen as self-serving, greedy, and blind <coughs> to the need of the masses. The lack of security, tax policy, repression of dissidents, intellectuals, and uh, minority groups. Um, the Almoravids would give way after a long and bloody insurgency in Morocco. Um, to, uh, to the Almohads, and the Almohads would very rather rapidly um, be able to take over um, not just uh, Morocco, but uh, extend into the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Now the Almohads were also Berbers, but they're of a different <coughs> religion, uh, and um, they, they had different customs uh, than the, uh, the Sanhaja Berbers of the um, Almoravids. Um, now, it's the Almohads who are painted as the most fanatical and harmful to religious minorities, responsible for a new low point in interfaith relations. And while I in no, uh, in no, mean, um, in no way mean to absolve the Almohads of their many terrible crimes, the details paint a more complex picture. The founder of the movement, Ibn Tumart, um, had to base his earliest claims to political authority uh, in the lax practice and doctrinal error of the Almoravids. The biography of Ibn Tumart, the founder of the movement, written by um, al Baidak, one of his first followers, tells over and over of how Ibn Tumart would march into a town, attack wine cellars, shops selling musical instruments. Um, it, would, it also tells of his severe critic of, um, a critique of um, a, a kind of local practice of men cross-dressing, wearing makeup, and it repeats um, over and over again the charge that the Almoravids were effeminate because the Sanhaja Berbers, who come from the desert south, um, the custom was that their men wore veils and their women did not. So that, that gender reversal, it becomes one of the, the, the oft-repeated kinds of, you know, um, just barbed critiques um, of the Almoravids. Um, these stories serve to underscore both the Almohad accu accusations of lax religious practices among their enemies and provide numerous instances in which Ibn Tumart survived the wrath of angry mm. mobs and shopkeepers, either due to his cunning or divine intervention. So once again, we're setting him very early. He's, he's, he's a leader who's not afraid to go against the tide, to risk his skin for true belief uh, and fight uh, these, uh, these, this other group that had made such claims to um, doctrinal uh, fidelity and such, and that has slipped into um, uh, has slipped into sinfulness. Now, one anecdote, certainly apocryphal, tells us uh, much about the deeper philosophical divide between the two groups. The story goes that as a young man, Ibn Tumart uh, met Al Ghazali in Baghdad and told him the details of the burning of his books in Cordoba. The great Sufi thinker then cursed the Almoravids uh, and prophesied that the young Ibn Tumart would rise to power and crush them. Now, it doesn't matter that this mm. uh, meeting could never have taken place. It still demonstrates the powerful reverberations of the clash between the Maliki jurists and other intellectual currents in the Islamic West. It's, it's another indication of the kind of the vitality of this fight among these two groups uh, that are, you know, oftentimes just dismissed as both being fanatic, but, but the differences between them, I think, are, are really very important. Um, the story provides Ibn Tumart with a prominent spiritual isnad, or a, a, chain, of, uh, a, a chain of transmission, um, and its um, concomitant spiritual authority, and helps to buttress later claims to being the Mahdi. Now, modern scholars have devoted considerable attention to outlining the logical inconsistencies in Ibn Tumart's thought and analyzing his messianic streak. 
The important part, point here, though, is that under the al muahids there was a not insubstantial flourishing of uh, intellectual and cultural life. And this is especially in contrast to the, to the earlier period where you had the government um, pretty systematically uh, tr basically repressing uh, in anything that was seen as uh, philosophical, theosophical, intellectual, or, or could be construed as dissident in any way. Um, uh, the 12th century Ibn uh, logician, Ibn Tumlus, uh, writes of how under the Almoravids the study of logic was regarded with fear and met with accusations of faithlessness and atheism. Um, he found conditions more favorable under the new regime. Ibn Tufail, the celebrated philosopher and I would say mystic, uh, served as court physician to the al Muahid Sultan uh, Abu Yaqub uh, Yusuf. He was succeeded in that post by Ibn Rushd um, Averroes. A surprising figure at the al Muahid court uh, is the Zajal poet Ibn Kuzman, whose verses competed with those of the notorious Abu Nuwas in both their brilliance and their scandalously impious themes. Sufism in general set deeper roots during this time without the repression that characterized the previous regime. None of this should obscure the dark um, side of the al -Muahids. From the first, they began a not entirely systematic campaign of forced conversions of Jews. Those who resisted uh, were slaughtered. As is always the case with forced conversions, suspicion that the converts were insincere and would defile the body politic of real Muslims led to laws requiring special dress for Jewish converts, formal boards of inquiry into their belief, which prefigured the uh, Inquisition by several hundred years. Now, if the mystics and intellectuals enjoyed some respite, by late in the 12th century, al muahid political weakness led to a pattern of appeasement of extremist elements. Now it was Averroes' books that were condemned and burned. But as we know, repressing ideas and burning books, uh, while it may for a time uh, uh, bring uh, governments uh, temporary uh, res respite uh, or temporary support of uh, extremists, um, never results in uh, long-lasting support for a government. And by this time, there was little gain uh, in blaming minority groups for any uh, political difficulties of the regime, uh, for only minimal communities uh, of minorities, if any, uh, still remained. Little by little, those Maliki jurists who had been dislodged from power when the al Muahids had first come to power, that respite which allowed Sufism and, and other currents to have to flourish to a greater degree than they had uh, prior, um, began regaining power uh, and prestige and beginning, beginning to levy accusations of bid'ah heresy, licentiousness against Sufis, prompting many of them to travel to the East, oftentimes never to return. Among these were Ibn Sabain and Shushtari, Ibn Arabi, Abu Madian, Abu al-Hassan al-Shadili, and countless other Moroccan and Andalusian Sufis traveled East, where surely they met other Sufis, other refugees from other conflicts, uh, from uh, the uh, the Mongol invasions of Baghdad, etc., from from the Crusades, where these two currents were able to cross fertilize, and and I think one of the things that we see in the writings of these 13th century Sufis, and for me one of the greatest takeaway lessons from all of this, is that we begin to see. Um, much more explicitly than in earlier writings, and certainly more explicitly than later writings, the importance of um, the Im the importance of what is deep, and the the non-importance of sec of sectarian differences. We see this theme in the two the two verses that I read earlier in the talk about you know the beloved is in Christian and in Jew. We see this theme echoed in the verse of Rumi, who is an exact contemporary of, of Shushtari. We see this theme echoed in the verse of countless poets, I think, in this century. It's a century where these disruptions acutely reminded people that claims uh, that one can write 
uh, political problems or social problems by the forced practice of religion, by forced piety, um, never will solve social problems. That uh, the uh, the persecution of minorities, be they religious minorities or um, uh, or, or intellectual minorities or dissidents uh, will will not bear fruit, and I think that that's what makes the the message of of all of these Sufis um, still resonate so powerfully with us. Uh, the words of Ibn Arabi, the words of Shushtari, the words of Rumi, and I hope uh, that that this uh, inspires all of us to return to those uh, and uh, and try to live out those words of, of tolerance uh, and in, in its deepest meaning and in, in a way that I think probably never was 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 fully lived out in Al Andalus, but which we can hope to um, live out in in our own time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> That's great. I think uh, let's let's do questions from the floor. I have a hundred, but I bet you have the same ones. So better from you. Uh, hi, uh, Ermal Hidek, graduate student, University of Maryland. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alvarez, for the uh, very uh, informative uh, presentation. I had actually two questions. Uh, the first is, well, we know that in the by the time that the al morabitun and the al mawahidun come out of, of northern Africa, uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on uh, in the periphery, and not only in the periphery, but even in the center mm -hmm. of the Muslim world, if you could call Baghdad at that Absolutely. point the center mm -hmm. of it. So you have the Mongols from one side, and then at some point you have the Crusades, and then you have the, the, the Christian uh, kingdoms from, from northern Spain. Now, I know that in, in, in history, uh, it's pretty hard to attribute causality mm -hmm. to events, even more so when we're talking about grand events mm -hmm. and you know, smaller developments in that relationship. But how, uh, how, how important is that context uh, of, of siege mm -hmm. in, in explaining the emergence of, uh, of more radical uh, groups. A, the second, uh, we're talking about this chiaroscuro, uh, mm -hmm. really, so not, it's not really black and white, the, the history of, of Muslim Spain, but it's more chiaroscuro, more chiaro in the beginning, more scuro uh, <laughs> during the end. Uh, but even during that more scuro end, uh, it, has the, it has the depth if you will, to produce thinkers like uh, Maimonides and, uh, and uh, Ibn Rushd and Aver Roas. Uh, so my question would be, during that more scuro period, what's the situation in the north of Spain? So what's the situation as regards tolerance, as regards uh, intellectual and religious openness among the northern uh, Christian kingdoms mm -hmm. uh, of Spain? So those two questions. Thank you very much. Okay, well, th those are uh, two really, thank you very much. Those are two Good really questions. wonderful questions. Yeah. Um, uh, let, let's see, let's see how to tackle them. You know, I think, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, all of these, these things are, are interconnected. And I think that there's a, there's a huge tendency in the telling of history to simple, to oversimplify because, it, because it's hard. I mean, there's so many pieces, there's so much going on all at the same time and seeing how this, this interlocks. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, the, uh, the the sort of constant um, advance of Christian forces in in um, uh, Iberia um, cer certainly coincides with uh, I as I mentioned you know the, the Mon you know Mongol invasions um, the Crusades there is this sense that on both ends of Islamic territory that Islam is in retreat and I think thinkers thinkers and politicians, I mean, and, and ordinary people are, are, are looking for solutions. And they're looking for answers. Why, why, how could this be? I mean, this had never happened before. I mean, it, you know, Islam should not, be, should not be in this position. And so I think that there's, that in, in some way, you know, that both of these, these two groups, the Al-Muravids and the um, Al-Muahids, offer um, different theological kinds of explanations about how one lives the best kind of Islam, uh, and and but but both of those both of these groups concur in the in the sense that um, the poor or the lax or the improper practice of Islam is is one of the causes of their decline. And rather than and I think that that probably one of the biggest uh, faults is looking at it in terms of uh, a civilizational weakness due to. Um, uh, 
due to spiritual or or um, or moral laxity, rather than looking at, at um, as as much as they should uh, at um, political problems, at military problems, at taxation, at, at these other issues, which really kind of kind of undermine. But so so the solutions they offer are, um, you know, for example, don't you know people. People have been drinking wine when they shouldn't be drinking wine. You know, this, these these kinds of answers. Um, and and I think though that that the constant defeats only serve to radicalize those groups because because they they, they saw they weren't successful in a way, um, and that that only led to intensification of their of their efforts. Um, so, let's see the, the question about the North. Now, th this gets to one thing which I, which I didn't have time to get to into the talk. Um, the, in, in the north of Spain, uh, in the 13th century, so as things, as things get more and more desperate uh, in the south, uh, in northern Spain, in places like, um, in places like Toledo, uh, you have what is oftentimes celebrated as, as convivencia. Uh, and these, you know, for example, the, the rule of um, the, uh, the 13th century um, Christian king Alfonso um, el Sabio, uh, w and he uh, welcomed to his court uh, Jews and Muslims. There was enormous translation activity. Uh, although, although there were certainly um, laws that were promulgated at the time that you know, also um, asked the Jews to wear distinguishing um, uh, badges on them and distinguishing clothing. Uh, it's a time that, that's um, that's celebrated as well for um, allowing uh, both of these religious minorities on the Christian side to live according to their own religious law. So while the Siete Partidas um, tell you know say that Jews need to wear the distinguishing badges and uh, and uh, you know there are. Um, Problems and and uh, and punishments for them. They are also guaranteed for the right to practice their religion. There are strict laws that prohibit Christians from harassing Jews in their in their um, synagogues. I mean, this is a kind of a level of protection in the 13th century that is really uh, remarkable. And and the same thing for Muslims who were living under under Christian rule at the time. Their practice of religion was was protected you know, and they were protected from being dragged into court on their holy days. I mean so there's a whole series of protections and so then when we talk about the decline of time and, and, and this was pretty much the same legal situation that obtained in that uh, Chiaro period um, in, uh, in Islamic Spain in the earlier period that you know the religious minorities were um, were certainly entitled to continue to practice their religion uh, in uh, and, and be subject to their own religious law and only be subject to the law of the majority in the cases in which um, there was a, some kind of a conflict. Like for example, a, a, a property dispute with a Muslim, it, it would be the, the, the Islamic uh, law that would then, or then the, the, the Muslim judge that would have jurisdiction in the case. But otherwise, if, if you had a, a divorce or a family issue, the, all of that was subject to your own religious law um, in, in, in those kind of, Happy, happier times on, on both sides. So, so you know, I think partly it's that, that legal um, system that allowed um, communities a certain degree of autonomy in, in, the, in the happier periods on, bo on both sides. Um, and the other thing I think is, is pure demographics. I mean, I, I think that, w that certainly in the 13th century, in 13th century Christian Spain, uh, when um, uh, the Christians, as they're making these rapid advances, the population that they are now uh, governing large populations of Muslims. They cannot, they, they simply are not in a position to, to, to um, persecute them uh, and um, in that way. They, they need to find a way for these groups to coexist. Uh, and I think the same kinds of demographic uh, uh, forces are, are very much uh, at play uh, in, in, in uh, in Islamic Spain, that uh, while you have large enough minorities to wield a certain amount of political and uh, economic clout, uh, that uh, the the minorities tend to to fare much better. That as those communities um, diminish, either due to conversions or or other uh, forces, that that their lot is just spirals. It spirals and it gets worse and worse. Oh. Other question, questions. <coughs> Gentleman over here. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alvarez. That was a truly fascinating talk. I'm, I'm particularly interested in Before the... Tell us who you are. Pardon? Could you tell us who you are? Uh, sure. I'm so Terry Waltz. I'm in Washington, D.C. And uh, <coughs> I'm very interested in the uh, elaboration of the tolerance that went on in Muslim Spain, which which you had to gloss over, and mm -hmm. because of the shortness of time, I realized that. Uh, and you just mentioned a little bit of it uh, in the answer that you just gave. But were there other <coughs> aspects of the toleration of Muslims, Jews, and Christians that you can point to other than the, the idea that each community is able to uh, live by its own uh, domestic, you know, personal laws or personal statutes? Were there other aspects of that, of the uh, intercommunality between uh, the various sects? Um, oh, th that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, I think generally, uh, a lot of the a lot of the evidence uh, that's kind of marshaled uh, to address that question uh, rate, uh, goes to cultural kinds of issues. You know, one, one very famous example uh, is uh, a new uh, form of, of poetry and music that arose uh, in um, 10th, 10th century Spain, uh, which is, is called the Muasha uh, And um, these, are, uh, there's, these are poems. They break very strongly with the, the kinds of uh, rhyme schemes and uh, the, the traditional Arabic pro prosody. Uh, they, um, they, they are imitated by Jewish poets. Uh, so you have this new form, this, an and, this, this Andalusian form, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of, a, I think, I, I see it as very much a sort of assertion of, an, of, an, of a new kind of hybrid Andalusian identity, and we'll get to the reason why, why I would say it's hybrid. Um, so you have the Hebrew poets. Now, for, for a long time, we had manuscripts uh, of uh, these poems which had these final verses that nobody could read. And they would get recopied, uh, and no one could read them. We had, we had Hebrew, we had copies of Hebrew ones that had final verses, and, and people kept recopying them, not really understanding what the final verses said. Uh, and we had um, some Arabic manuscripts with, with, with the same thing. And in, interestingly, it was um, in, in 1948 uh, that uh, a, um, a Jewish scholar named Samuel Stern uh, published a, a very interesting article mm -hmm. in which uh, he uh, he basically broke the code, you know, realizing, of course, that these final verses, the refrain, which sets the meter and the rhyme for all the other for all the other strophes, was actually in Spanish, uh, and so it's Spanish written with Hebrew characters. Uh, in the case of the Arabic uh, ones, it's uh, Arabic. Uh, it's a Spanish written with with Arabic characters. So, th this set off you know quite a lot of debate uh, about uh, you know why these uh, verse forms are so unusual because they, because they are a really a ra rather stark break with with the past um, and the idea that what what's happening is that the poets these Hebrew and Arabic poets are sampling if you will verses from pre-existing lyric they, and they're riffing on that verse and creating their own their own uh, lyrics now there this is very controversial and I don't want to get into all the de the details of it um, I mean it's it's intriguing. I think it's intriguing to many people just that the very idea that there were these this kind of love songs, you know, happening kind of across across uh, religious and linguistic and many times class boundaries, um, and the and the idea of sampling uh, is is very interesting. Um, uh, I'm particularly interested in this question because. Uh, later on, uh, my the Sufi poets that that I work on um, adopt these kind these this the same verse form, which had always been scorned by those who like uh, collect anthologies because it wasn't classical and it had a lot of vernacular el elements uh, in it, and it, it just wasn't wasn't high poetry. This was this was kind of the poetry that you sang in licentious gatherings, uh, you know. Um, uh, the 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 Sufi poets borrow these verses. And sing, use them to sing about mystical love. Uh, 
Uh, and you know, it, in many cases, they actually do the same thing. They borrow the same refrains from pre-existing poems. So, so once again, we have another example of that that sort of uh, contrafactura, or you know, the, the borrowing, the remaking, and more evidence that that part of the tradition of these poems was was that. So, you know, if if you if you accept the idea that um, some of those those pre-existing um, final lyrics came from a from a pre-existing uh, uh, Span Spanish uh, tradition of um, of song, you know, you have a, a pretty interesting evidence of of a kind of, of contact. But you know, I mean, that's 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 just one example. I mean, there's so many there's so many examples of you know right of writers kind of sharing uh, work across borders. Of you know, for example, you know, you have Jews who are are so well versed uh, in the um, in the the sciences, et cetera. And you know, I, I think it, it gets to the point where I, I don't think it's even right to talk about the Islamic sciences or or the Jewish sciences. There, there, I think there was a, a thought at that time, 10th century, 11th century, even even later, that the sense that, that um, uh, intellectual pursuits were the patrimony of all of all men. That that they were not that that that, that kind of share. It's just like now. I, I think it would, for those of us in the United States, it, it, I think it would be very odd for us to to to, to regard math as the, the province of one you know religious group and chemistry as that of another. And we you know we're sharing we share these things across boundaries. That Arabic is the common uh, the common uh, language of. Um, Scholarship. Um, Maimonides wrote in, in Judeo Arabic, that is uh, Arabic written with Hebrew characters. My, you know, Maimonides was extremely well uh, familiar with um, the uh, um, with with writings on the Quran, with you know, with with religious texts uh, in in Islam. Um, and then I'll, I'll just stop with one more with one more. I mean, I mean, I, I, I re there's there's me there's really there's very much more, and I'd be happy to give you um, bibliography on on the subject. Um, uh, in in the 13th century, which is the subject, the, the area that I've done most of my work on, um, there's a group of uh, of Jewish mystics now living in um, Cairo, including the son of Maimonides' son, and uh, he uh, left. They've left behind a body of of work and writings, uh, which are uh, once again written in sometimes in Judeo Arabic, etc. Uh, and um, the um, the scholar, whose name I will forget right now, um, <laughs> has done fa fascinating work on uh, the the claim by this group that they they call themselves Jewish Sufis. Mm -hmm. They study the work of the Islamic mystics, uh, and they claim they claim that mysticism for their own. In, in some cases, referring to it as a lost Jewish tradition, which has been kind of returned to to them uh, through the work of these of these uh, uh, Islamic mystics, um, it's it's a very it's a very fascinating work, and it's a, just one more testimony of, of the kind of fluidity and the porosity uh, of of these of these borders. And, and interestingly, this group of Jewish mystics has preserved for us at least one text, and I believe it's of Al-Ghazali, that otherwise is lost to us, otherwise does not exist in any um, other extant Arabic copy. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's another example. But, but anyways, there's, there's many more. I feel, I feel like I can't really do justice to your, to your question. I feel out of justice to the audience. There was one hand in back, and I think we're running out of time. Am I right? I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm taking that question. But your, your <laughs> answers are terrific. Uh, my name's Dan Lieberman. I wonder if you knew the proportions of these three ethnicities uh, during that era. You know, what percentage were Muslims, Christians, and Jews, and also, do you know how the Jews came there? Um, there have been, of course, with Shlomo Sands, the idea that these uh, Jews were converted from Berber tribes. I wonder if you know anything about that. Um, well, uh, my understanding is that there's evidence of, of Jews on the Iberian Peninsula um, that dating back to the first century. Um, so how they got there, I don't know, but we have long, long evidence of their, of their presence there. We have also have uh, long evidence that, you know, pretty much uh, any time that uh, matters got uh, kind of tough, uh, that uh, repression of the Jews was a, um, um, a, 
the, uh, uh, mechanism that uh, you know the rulers use to uh, divert divert attention from from uh, from the real from the real problems. Um, I, as for we do know we do know that at the time that Islam entered into North Africa, uh, that there were um, that there were some of the Berber tribes were Jewish. Uh, and um, I, I, I can't really answer the question about, you know, w what exactly, you know, were some of them, I believe some of them were converted to Islam. Um, I'm not really sure, you know, whether or not some of them continued, you know, or, or how long um, you had a, an indigenous Berber Jewish presence in North Africa. That would be an interesting thing to look into. Um, as for the numbers, I, I would say this is one of the areas that has, has unleashed an enormous amount of debate. Uh, you know, there's there there is a debate about how quickly, for example, the majority um, uh, Christian population was converted uh, to Islam, uh, and uh, based on uh, birth records and kind of uh, actuarial kinds of of data, uh, we have a, a, a proposed uh, curve of conversion. Um, uh, which you know basically shows you know what what we would expect that um, conversions uh, at first uh, you know were somewhat limited that they kind of increased and that as conversions increased that it, it snowballed. I mean basically who who wants to be the last few members of of their community? Now um, it, it is said that um, the uh, because there was a poll tax imposed uh, on the minority communities uh, that uh, the uh, uh, Muslim authorities were actually not so happy to have uh, skyrocketing conversions because it it it, uh, it eroded their tax base, uh, and so we have some documents um, detailing uh, the the judges actually um, questioning uh, people about the sincerity of their conversion. It's like you're not just converting because you want um, you know you want a tax benefit, et, et cetera. Um, so. So that's a kind of interesting, and it's certainly, I think, a good uh, re reply to anyone who who uh, would hold that that early conversion activity is on the basis of the sword, because there was there was no there was no benefit uh, to the to the government in in such a thing. Um, as as to the the relative numbers, I mean there. We, we know, for example, uh, that in um, uh, the 12th century, in the, t the tw one of the 12th century, no, 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 I'm sorry, the 11th century um, massacre of Jews uh, in uh, Granada, that the, the figures are put at three to 4,000. So that would be, in just one city, a community of three to 4,000 Jews. Um, we have, unfortunately, um, Benjamin Tudela, Benjamin of Tudela, um, who provides us with very interesting um, figures for the Jewish community in the rest of uh, the uh, uh, medieval world, um, doesn't really provide us uh, much of interest in, um, in Spain. Uh, so. So it's kind of fragmentary, but you know the the Jews were concentrated in cities, uh, and, um, and there were substantial there were substantial populations of Jews in places like Barcelona, um, Girona, uh, Granada, um, Toledo, etc. So, well, thank you, Dr. Alvarez. <laughs> <laughs> I converted. Uh, if I can, if I can just offer an afterthought. It seems like the bridges uh, at the times uh, of tolerance were in poetry, in science, in vulgar poetry, and in mysticism. And I think there's something interesting there. I'm, I'm not one given to necessarily to a Western sequence of cause and effect history or teleological history. I'm a little bit more of the Eastern school that all the elements of good and evil are always there and somehow in a balance and, mm -hmm. and would rather look at the factors that tip the scale one way or another. Mm -hmm. But with that, you know, after afterthought, thank you. Thanks to the Rumi Forum for a really stimulating discussion. I